the record button. There you go. We're recording. All right. Well, thank you very much for your patience. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, um, all right. So it's great to um, say hello from from Europe. And this, I mean, you know, this this pandemic thingy has done uh, terrible things, but as far as uh, remote being able to remotely visit, it's, it's, it's kind of cool, I guess. At the beginning, I was really reluctant to the whole enterprise, but now I'm getting used to it. Kind of, uh, there are some pluses. Anyhow, so uh, today I'll tell you some about uh, the work that uh, was done mostly by Oscar, you know, sort of the, he got his degree uh, almost two years ago uh, with some of this work. And, uh, and later on collaborated with uh, Natalia who also got a degree uh, last summer. And so um, this is, you know, uh, the, their work. The, um, before I, I go into that, I, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know where Ohio is and what, what Ohio University is, I have this little intro. So here's Ohio, close to Canada, as you can tell, the, the Great Lakes are the, the north uh, border. And uh, that's the state. Athens is in the southeast corner. Uh, some politics, some politics here. This is the two the two electoral maps. Red here means bad, meaning Trump, and uh, blue means uh, Democratic. In this case, Biden. And as you can tell, the state became redder in this uh, 2020 election, where Trump won the state by five points. So. Um, and so Athens is this blue uh, blue shadow here in the southeast corner. Uh, and you can tell, even though it was relatively close, the big cities are democratic in Athens and the rest of the state is red. So you, you're, um, I guess you have a similar experience with Bolsonaro, right? Where you're surrounded by, by a sea of the, his supporters. Anyhow, so the, um, the um, Ohio University, this is a nice picture in summer, probably. Um, you see, they, they make a, a lot of effort to, to make the buildings look old. Um, and uh, that's the main, the main uh, square, that building back there is where the president sits. Um, and as this uh, thing advertises, the, the school was established in 1804. It has about 30,000 students. Uh, apparently it was ranked college town, number one college town in the USA, whatever that means. And uh, one of these uh, honors is that uh, a physics PhD got the Nobel Prize in chemistry, actually, structural chemistry. And so that's, that's one of our um, points to brag, I guess. Anyhow, back to business. So I'm, I'm um, you know, you have, of course, uh, been familiar now with, with these 2D materials that are uh, crystals that are only one atom or, or very few atoms thick. Uh, ever since the paper by, by Gaim in, in Novoselov in 05, now 15 years, they, they basically, this is where they announced grapha, uh, graphene rather in boronitride. And, and they also played around with several dicacogenides and even oxides. So, um, but of course, graphene took um, a lot of the, the, their effort and, and not, not much happened in their lab for, for a good uh, five years or something at that time. However, of course, they got Nobel Prize, as you know, and, and all these materials have been uh, studied, really. The, what is interesting is that they come from, from, graph, from graphene, which is uh, semi-metal, to these uh, MOS2 and tungsten and these guys that are semiconductors, maybe uh, in, uh, with a couple of electron volts uh, gap. There are these niobium-based materials that are metallic at room temperature and even superconductors at low. And there are uh, insulators, this boron nitride and zinc oxide. So, so they, it is, uh, really they come in, uh, in a big variety of, of different materials and many more are discovered pretty much every day, I guess. Well, I should say, by the way, that uh, I, you, if you have any questions, please uh, interrupt, you know, just, just unmute yourself and, and, uh, and pipe it out. No, no, please make it informal. So the, 
I, as I was saying, you know, so the 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 um, graphene took all of the um, Manchester attention, and in, in not much of what's happening on the dicarbonate. And part of it was that, of course, uh, graphene is a, it's a very good uh, material in that it, it's, uh, you can bias it uh, P and N. Well, you couldn't do that with the dicarbonate because they're, they, you know, they're intrinsically doped and you could only sort of basically gate them to, to being insulator, but not switch. And, and um, so they were kind of not, not as interesting in that regard. But in 2010, there was a, a group that studied optics of Columbia. And, and they basically proved that when you thin this material all the way to a monolayer, then one interesting thing happens and that is that the material becomes from in the bulk is an indirect semiconductor. So not very uh, active optically, but in the monolayer, it becomes direct band semiconductor. So all of a sudden, all the people that do optics, not just transport, got interested in this, and 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 it took off again. I mean, if you look at the uh, the publications from that year on, they just exploded. Now, the the of course, one virtue is that it is a semiconductor. So all the tradition of you know gating and doping and and creating uh, transistors was also attractive, and people of course did that too. One other, uh, one interesting feature of these materials is that they have, because they include moly and tungsten, which are heavy transition metal atoms, there is a strong spin orbit coupling, which uh, results in a splitting of the valence band, for example, that is, that is rather large um, on the order of a uh, hundred or a, a couple hundred milli electron volts. This is much larger than what happens in other semiconductors like indium arsenide or gallium arsenide where a spin orbit of 10 millivolts is large, right? So this is, in that respect, a very different kind of semiconductor in, uh, from the spin orbit point of view. And, and you know, has advantages and disadvantages, of course. Now, the, the other thing that, that is interesting, sorry, I, I think I lost my window open there. The, the, um, the other thing that is interesting is that if you look at the, this uh, structure up here at the top right, you see my cursor, right? Um, guys, do, do you see my cursor? Yes? I don't see you anymore. Let's see. Yes, you, okay. So if, if, you, look at, if you look at this uh, image up, up here, you can see that it is not inversion symmetric. If you were to flip the crystal, uh, you, you see this bond uh, between green and yellow will be in a different orientation. And that means that you broke in inversion symmetry uh, and together with the spin gives rise to, uh, to this locking of the valley um, and the spin. So that if you're in one K point, you know, it's a, it, it's a triangular lattice. So the lattice is hexagonal like that of graphene kind of. So there are K points and gamma points and so on. But if you look at the, the K valley, the, if you look at uh, uh, this K here, the, it is the, the dashed line involves uh, spin up. And if you go to the time reverse momentum, which will be this K prime, there the spin has to reverse, right? To, to keep the spectrum times reverse symmetric. Um, and so that, that means that the spin is kind of locked in, in the individual uh, valleys and it gives you polarization memories and, and a number of interesting features. So these are very interesting materials in that regard. Now, you, you have probably heard of, about this because of course, once you have a, a, an entire uh, catalog of different materials that are chemically stable and, and, um, and exfoliable and all that, people said, well, you know, I can make a, a, a material by design by putting different types of materials, I can create something. Uh, and being in, in Denmark, this is kind of a nice, logo right um for the lego uh an, a commercial so but but the point is that um you can play around with with these uh heterojunctions or uh, that are that are of different materials and and people have been playing around with these now the, today i'm, I'm going to tell you about a different kind of super lattice and that is a lateral super lattice and, and the idea here is that you change material across an interface like this so this will be the equivalent, you know, the, the analog of the 2D super lattices that you find in, in 3D, right? Where you make a cut and of course make an interface. 
Here, of course, the material is 2D, so you make a cut in an interface, it becomes 1D. So you lower the dimension. And, and in fact, people have managed to do this kind of thing. Uh, and, and it's uh, sort of amazing. And, and we want to you know, sort of ask what happens to the states of those interfaces, for example. So here are some, some experiments, just to see that um, it's not just our imagination. Now, the, um, see the, these are TEM images um, of, the, uh, of such an interface. Uh, different, um, you see here the metal because it's the one that is uh, electronically dense. And so uh, you can see that the, the shading changes because you're changing composition. So you go from, from tungsten on the left to moly sulfide on the, in this case, it's, it's, they're changing metal. Uh, in all cases, it's sulfur, the, the other part of the material. And, and that's important because it, the size of the, uh, oh, the lattice constant rather, is mostly determined by the calcogen atom. And so when you change metal across an interface like this, you change the lattice constant, but only slightly, so there is relatively little strain. What happened, and of course, you can have different orientations, so-called zigzag, you can see here, or uh, an armchair, with different, you know, depending on where the crystallite is, is grown. And, and here on the right, what you see is, it's a photoluminescent data of such, a, such an interface. The middle part of the grain is moly sulfide, the outer is tungsten sulfide, and you can see that the photoluminescence has different colors because, of course, being different composition, it has different gaps for the exciton. So they can subtract off the, the, the two peaks corresponding to these colors. And what you end up with is with another, uh, with, oops, with a luminescence that is uh, right there in the middle, as you can tell. And, and that tells you that, in fact, that interface behaves differently, right? It has its own exciton. It has its uh, states that, are, that, that live right at the interface. Now, here are some, uh, down here below, there is another example. Uh, uh, in this case is uh, selenide, the calcogen. But again, it's a, again, rather sharp interface, all right? Now notice the scale is only uh, maybe 100 nanometers is that much. So it's relatively hard to make these very nice interfaces, but you know, there people are trying. Now, you can, on the other hand, so we're saying the calcogen matters for the lattice constant. In, in what you see here on the left, it is tungsten is the same metal, but they're changing the, from sulfur to selenium. So by changing the calcogen, the lattice constant changes dramatically. The strain is much larger to the, to the extent that the layer that grows in between grows like an accordion. So by of course changing composition, you'd be able to control the strain and this, there's this group in Chicago uh, park that, that plays around with these sort of materials. But, the point is that it is possible to play around with different interfaces. All right, any questions? Sergio, it appears that there is some big uh, echo. Echo, I have an echo. I don't understand why. Is it um, all of a sudden, right? Um, did it, is it better? Yeah. It's okay for me. Okay, so in, I, any, I, any I do have a question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, can I ask? Yeah. Please, please, by all means. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, I was wondering here, you're considering a monolayer, right? Correct. They are not stack, stacking above one another, right? No, no not, in uh, this, okay. not in this data that I'm showing you, no. Uh, all right, okay, thank you. Sure, I mean, there are, there are other experiments where people do play with, with the stacking, and there's many, because you can make all sorts of especially indirect accidents and, and some interesting physics too. But here I'm, I'm focusing on the lateral, a monolayer, okay? Uh, just another very basic question. Uh, so uh -huh. when you, you're talking about accidents here, you're considering that uh, an electron is in, in uh, say, in the, the moles two and the hole in the WS2? Well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. I mean, just quickly, okay. but yes, I'll talk about it in a second. Okay, thank All you. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let, let, let's, um, the question is, what, what can you say theoretically from about the, these states? There will be a question. And so for that, I, I have this little, 
This is the simplest, you know, k.p Hamiltonian, if you will, uh, because the spin are, uh, you have this strong spin orbit, I can just consider one electron for an electron in a hole for each spin component. And so that will be this uh, valence and conduction band energy. And this is the Hamiltonian that typically describes that. You know, it is reminiscent of this graphene by having these off diagonal components. But of course, there is a finite gap. There is an asymmetry between the two orbitals in this case. And, and so it can be written like this. Now, what is nice about a, a Hamiltonian like that is that it can also be written like in terms of a spin, uh, you know, the, the poly spin matrices times this vector. And, and so this immediately uh, sort of gives you this connection with the geometry of the, of the K space. So by looking at this effective Hamiltonian that, is, uh, that has a structure in, in reciprocal space, you can extract that, that structure by looking at the Chern number, for example, which is this uh, Berry curvature integrated over the Brion zone. And, and this tells you whether the, the, uh, the geometry is, is interesting or not for this. Uh, and it turns out that, that you can do this analytically. I mean, it's simple enough that you can do this analytically. And the Chern number is given by this expression, where delta here refers to the uh, band gap, right? And uh, alpha beta correspond to these coefficients that are give you the local curvature or the inverse effective masses, however you want to say it. And so the point is that depending on this, on the values of these materials, you can in fact have that this chair number per valley, uh, this is the Hamiltonian for one valley, one spin species, you can, you can find that it will be non-zero, right, for alpha larger than beta. And, and so this will tell you that in fact, for these conditions, the, the, uh, the band structure itself, this is just the simplest uh, argument. The band structure protects the, these edge states as long as the valleys don't mix, uh, which is of course an assumption. Now valleys, the, so this is similar to the argument that people make for topological insulators, except that in that case, you involve the spin and so the, 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 project, the protection is topological in that if you have uh, sort of a typical scatter, um, spinless scatters, then the, the, uh, they, they protect that, right? This, this is structure protection. Here, there is not such protection because this, this is per spin species and per valley. And so as long as you have a really sharp impurity, this will actually be broken, all right? But, but it tells you, you know, if I have clean interfaces, then uh, sharp interfaces, then this would be a good, this will argue for the existence of, of a state that are well-defined on the interface. All right, so you can do calculations. I mean, you put a, put a Hamiltonian on a grid and, and find on a ribbon and find that you can play around with the various values of alpha and beta. And you can see that in this regime where alpha is less uh, uh, than zero and beta positive, you have a gap, clean gap, which would be just a trivial super, uh, semiconductor. But if you make, um, uh, you know, for different values for alpha positive, now all of a sudden you have edge states that appear. This is this will be the k the k valley the k point. In uh, for depending on values, of course they can they can uh, these states move around in the gap. And so what that means, uh, you know, physically is that for each valley there is a right and left mover defined by these states that live in the gap. They live physically on the edges of the ribbon and in principle, you know, are robust. The corresponding uh, other K, va K valley will have the opposite, of course. And so that's what gives you this protection, but not topological, all right? So, but, but they're there. Now, the, um, Carlos is my student uh, at the time, sort of did some calculations. And indeed, if you have a triangular flake, you look and, and there are these states that are well-defined on the, in this case is an edge, not an interface, but, but it's, they're there. All right, so, so, so one expects these states to be there. So now, now we wanna, in fact, describe them better. So for that, Oscar um, did a, a, what is called a three orbital description of, the, of these materials. These are the orbitals that, that characterize the states close to the band gap. Um, in uh, this, this Hamiltonian has been developed by, by Liu and company a few years back 
for the clean material. So we have parameters for the various. And then the idea is that when you when you make an interface, you of course stitch them together by by putting in a, a Hamiltonian that couples the two ribbons. All right. Now uh, the ribbons can have different geometries. I mean, they can have many different, but in particular, they can have these zigzag uh, edges, like like it is shown here, or it can give you the 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 armchair again just like in graphene in this case this will be the edge of the ribbon and this whole thing will be extended on the left the extension is horizontal and uh, those up and top are the are the edges of the ribbon it's interesting that the geometry of this tells you that one edge is calcogen uh, mostly right the, the yellow atom while the other edge is still zigzag but the other atom so to speak is the or the other atom is is the metal here is the molly all right so uh for for brevity and clarity i'll just concentrate on the six i will study them all but uh let's let's uh look at these so before i show you the results for the for this interface let me show you the the results for the diff for the separate ribbon so um so here on the left in green colors you see these edges states that i argued for before so this is the k point you see those have the, the edge state. This is the other K point. Um, there are, you can barely see them in, in this slide, but th there are gray and green uh, triangles corresponding to the two um, helicities, to the two different spin species. All right. Uh, but so there's four levels there. And in, in, uh, notice that the dispersion is not linear anymore far away from the K point because, of course, the Hamiltonian is more complicated in general. In, well, um, notice that it is not a smack in the middle of the gap, but they're a little shifted because of these alpha beta parameters in that, in that uh, the, uh, diagram that I'll show you. Now, for the, for the tungsten disulfide, the, um, you have similar structure. Notice here that the, that the spin orbit coupling is stronger, so the gray triangles are further away from the red, but again, it has the same sort of similar structure. Notice the, the dispersion is rather asymmetric because of this spin orbit coupling. All the, uh, all the states are, of course, time reversal symmetric as, as, you sh as they should be. Now, when you make an, um, oh, the other thing is that the, the, the states that disperse up or the ones that disperse down correspond to the different edges in the ribbon, right? The metal or the calcogen. So you can basically uh, characterize them. So now when you make the interface, you can imagine that it would be the states that are nearby that will get distorted. Um, so you'll have the outer edges, which will remain basically untouched, this green and red. But the one, the interface now that has one state on each side of this ribbon, uh, in fact, they hybridize. They gap each other because they see each other. They're, they're, the electrons start tumbling back and forth, and you see, and you end up with these. Uh, with, with these blue uh, dispersion bands, again, there is there is always two of them in gray, and so that that you actually by making this interface, you can see that you created a new gap in the material. So it will be an, a different semiconductor. That these states live at the interface, and as a consequence, will inherit you know properties from the two materials. So um, it's kind of an interesting object. Now the um, let me let me and so so I I, I hope I uh, sort of uh, describe for you that in fact these one D states straddle both materials they have a string a strong spin orbits which is unusual for one D materials in general and and they have non-trivial dispersion which is also peculiar it isn't just left and right movers or parabolic it's, it's something that is uh, Rather complicated, depending on where where you are in energy. Um, so you, uh, there was a question about the exciton. Well, you see, if you have an exciton and these excitons live at the interface, uh, you will have, uh, you know, the the you will have different configurations of excitons being on the same material, being on the other, on both, and and it will depend on energetics as to what is the one that dominates. Right? Or in fact, all of them can exist and just they'll have different lifetimes as well. In, in um, P 
people have started studying this both in experiments and in theory and in, in, I think it's so much is to be studied to be understood but the, the other thing is that because the, the uh, you can dope this material so that the Fermi level is right where the edge with these uh, gap states occur you can imagine that you'll have a uh, charge density wave so it's a 1d it's a 1d metal essentially and so um, there will be a strong interaction effect. So you can imagine charge density waves. Uh, there will also be, uh, if you put in magnetic impurities close to these interfaces, there will be effective exchange interactions between these magnetic impurities. You can imagine magnetizing bias, ma magnetically biasing these uh, edges or interfaces uh, in, in a number of other interesting um, uh, interaction effects, all right? So which, which will include interaction in, in a strong spin orbit. So uh, uh, today, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about these uh, effective interactions and in, in, um, about the magnetic, uh, magnetic biasing, if I have some time, although we started late. So let me, let me um, tell you about the magnetic, uh, the, the effective exchange interaction. You can imagine that, of course, these materials, one interesting uh, target will be to dope them with magnetic atoms because you can create a magnetic semiconductor. Uh, and there are various reasons why they will be interesting. And so people have actually tried with, with various degrees of success to incorporate uh, magnetic atoms, right? Vanadium or chromium or manganese or whatever. Here, here is a, a picture from the group at uh, Penn State where they incorporated manganese in, in molysulfide. Uh, uh, it is hard to have very high concentration of manganese apparently because of chemistry, but, but uh, it's possible. You could also imagine scattering um, magnetic impurities on top of this because after all it's a surface. And so you can um, investigate with STM or whatnot. So um, what, what you would find is that if you put so oh. if, if you put magnetic impurities on the on this material and, and ask, do they see each other? The answer is yes, they will interact uh, because they have magnetic moments. So their dipolar interactions are direct, but that is relatively short range. Uh, what is interesting is that there will be another longer range interaction typically that, that is uh, uh, what, what is called our RKKY interaction which basically is mediated by the electrons in the, in the material. So in other words, here, here's another diagram. This is a different uh, system, but it's the, the same idea. You have two magnetic impurities here, red and blue, or red and green rather. Uh, and they, they, they sit in a metal that has, um, that has electrons. And as an electron is scatters from one of these magnetic impurities, it carries information on where the impurity is and, and what is this spin. And, and as it carries that, it is scattered with a second uh, magnetic impurity and conveys that information, right? The probabilities for scattering, if you will. And so it turns out that if you uh, say, well, what is the net effect of this various scattering from the electrons? They can be described by this RKKY interaction by a Hamiltonian, it looks like this. J is proportional to S1 dot S2, the magnetic moments of the two impurities or, or magnetic species. Uh, and in the presence of uh, a spin orbit, as I mentioned, which is large here, in addition to this Heisenberg-like term, there is an S1 process to or non-collinear or bialosensky morilla interaction. So the, the first Heisenberg term, basically, depending on the sign of J, will, will prefer to create ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetically aligned impurities. Um, but it, it is uh, spherically symmetric, right? They can be in any direction. Relative to each other is important, but once that happens, then the, the, the spin either one or, or zero will, will matter. But in the Dialosinski Maria, you break that symmetry because now what you're trying to maximize, again, depending on the sign of D, is something that is, that is across from each other. So they're not parallel, anti-parallel, but in fact, at 90 degrees from each other will be, will be preferred if D is maximum. So there's a competition between the two interactions, which is of, of interest in, in magnetic systems. So he, and the other thing that is interesting is that because this is mediated by the electrons in the, in the system, the characteristic wavelength is this 
Fermi wavelength to KF. And so whenever, depending on if, if the magnetic impurities are commensurate with the Fermi wavelength, you will have this one phase. And if they're not, then you will have other, other amplitudes here. In all cases, it decays like a power law in a dimensionality that depends on the dimensionality of the host. So you can see that it oscillates between the sign changes here means ferro and anti ferro magnetically preferred. So this is generic interaction between magnetic impurities in a metal. This peculiar system, it's a 1D metal if you put the Fermi level right in the middle of the gap because the, re the rest, the bulk of the 2D material will be an insulator. And the only electrons that will be able to move and scatter around will be those at the edges. So in fact, you, you'll have interesting systems. So here is, the, here is the, the, the result, it's a little busy, but, but um, let me try to guide you through it. This is the Hamiltonian in general, now that we'll have XX, uh, this is the next superscript. So XX and YY terms, as well as ZZ, they could be uh, non, um, not fully Heisenberg, not symmetric in that the in-plane and out-of-plane components will be different. There is an intrinsic asymmetry in this material. And then there is this jalosinski morilla term, right? That goes like S1 cross S2. And so in, in these points uh, express those various components as a function of position. So you can see that this, uh, this purple one here is the ZZ, is the one that dominates as far as the, the it has the lowest um, uh, oscillations. Uh, while the other two, the in-plane and the dialosinski Maria, have a much higher frequency. The reason for that is that the, the, the sectors of the Fermi surface that are uh, involved in the scattering are different. And so they have different frequencies as a consequence. They have different Fermi frequencies. In, um, but what is interesting is that you know, all three interactions are, as far as amplitude, very, very similar. This is very peculiar because even in metals, in heavy metals, like platinum or whatever, the, the Alcinski Maria is, is typically much weaker than the direct Heisenberg interaction. Well, here we see they're comparable. And that is this, this peculiarity of this, of this system. So, so it's a very unique in that respect. Uh, Again, the electrons, the, the electrons that mediate this interaction will sit on both sides and straddling the interface. And, and, and so they bring all that information to the scattering. Uh, Oscar made this animation where you can see, depending on where the impurity is, the equilibrium configuration changes from being ferro to anti ferro And in fact, because of the Dialosinski Morilla, the animation doesn't show, but they, it, they can go be out of plane completely. Right, not just parallel and anti-parallel. So um, the the um, so the other thing that is interesting is that uh, the effective confinement of the wave functions gives you an uh, a rather long tail of this interaction. So the the impurities that are close to these interfaces will interact with each other for very very long distance, which will give rise to interesting physics. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, they have a strong uh, dialosinski maria interaction. So, so anything that, uh, so that means that if you put impurities in a, in a system that, that, that sits around this interface, the interactions will be relatively long range. They will have a strong non-collinear term. And so the ground state for the configuration that, a lot, you know, if you lower the temperature and ask what is the configuration of, of lowest energy, that would actually change uh, in a dramatic way at times. So here is here is uh, so depending on where you are in parameters, namely Fermi wavelength or separation of the atoms, you can go from something that looks like a ferromagnetic phase to something that that twists around because of this Dialosinski Maria interaction. And and you can do calculations, of course. Uh, something that that we actually did with Oscar in in Edson Vernet, uh, that just got published is in fact, look at the quantum mechanical uh, transitions that occur in this as a consequence of the non-collinear interaction. So I'm telling you a little bit about this. So um, if, if uh, here A stands for the strength of this Dialosinski Maria, and you can see that if the Dialosinski Maria is a small, zero or a small in this blue region, then we are in the, what is called a tilted ferromagnetic um, configuration 
which is indicated here. You can see that there is a slight tilt of the spins as the uh, I move along the chain, but they're locally ferromagnetically coupled, right? They're, they're parallel to each other for the most part with this low um, tilt as I go along. On the other hand, if this Jalosinski Maria strength is larger, now I'm in this green region, either on either side, positive or negative. So I'm in this star here and the cartoon that appears is more like this. Notice that here, the, there is a the spin here is to the right, here is uh, up, here is to the left, here is down and so on. So I can see that there is a cyclone that, uh, that uh, is developing in this case, only because I've increased the Jalosinski Maria. Here is the correlation thing, um, you know, that quantify this this effect. But but you can see that in the uh, in the strong uh, Jalosinski Morilla, you have this oscillatory pattern, while in the other case, it's kind of monotonous because it's feral. So interesting, uh, you can actually uh, map the entire uh, phase space for you know very various, various values of the Jalosinski Morilla, and characterize that. You can be in this tilted ferromagnetic, like I show you, and if if it is a, if it is a, a small value, uh, as I mentioned, there is this low tilting, but beyond a certain a certain value that that depends on other parameters, you can have a drastic jump. You see what here is illustrating is it's a smooth transition. This uh, characteristic wavelength of the cycloid is essentially zero. Uh, and then all of a sudden jump. In this jump, then then it's sudden, right? So it is slowly, slowly, and all of a sudden, plop, decides to make a to make loops, if you will. Well, on the other hand, if this other parameter, which is the the nearest neighbor, the J, remember, uh, but but of the third neighbors, is is uh, smaller in um, you can see or larger, I guess, more less negative, then there is a gradual uh, progression of that. Uh, cycloidal number instead of being a, a sudden phase transition. So, if you're um, if you're interested in in studying uh, magnetic systems, so this tells you that putting magnetic systems in these interfaces will will give you a very rich uh, phase diagram. Um, all right. So um, I I don't want to take too much of your time. It's seven o'clock. Uh, Edson, I need advice. Um, I have another section on magnetic biasing, but this will take me at least 10, 15 minutes. And I, I know it's late. And so I don't wanna, I, I know it was my fault for all the technical difficulties, but. Um, I, think, I think you can keep going. I think yeah, it's good yeah. for you, but not that much for us. Yeah, you, you, is that okay? Yeah. That's okay. okay, that's okay. Okay, so let, let me, um, all right, thank you. So I'll, I'll try to make it quick. So. You, you can imagine a different effect in that um, I have this robustly uh, robust states that live on the edge or the interface and ask what would happen if I magnetic bias them? In other words, put the, put the ribbon on top of a magnetic system. And, and so here, here, is, here is what, what happens. So th th this is a bit of an intro before I go to the ribbon. See, um, remember I told you that there is this valley spin uh, locking in the system so that the two valleys have opposite spins. And when I deposit the material on a magnetic substrate, of course, it's like having, a, uh, there's an exchange bias, so-called. And what that means is that, uh, say, the spin, the spin up gets shifted down in, in, in both cases. <coughs> and so, sorry, while the spin down will, sh will get shifted up, for example. So, so you will see that here on the right, that's what has happened, right? The, the spin down has moved up, the spin up has moved down. And here the same happened, but except that they crossed each other. And the end result, the same with the conduction band, is that you end up with an effective um, band structure on, on one valley that is different from the other. You broke, you've broken time reversal symmetry, of course, because there is an applied field. And, and um, that gives you different, uh, if you're interested in the bulk optical properties, now you will, for left and right uh, circularly polarized light, you'll have a different resonance frequency. <coughs> Sorry, different, a different excitonic uh, absorption. <coughs> Sorry. So 
and and people have actually measured that because you can measure then this right and, and left uh, polarization um, peaks and, and look at this circular uh, dichroism essentially. And so you can estimate that depositing the material on something like europium sulfide is equivalent to several Tesla of, of magnetic fields. There are no external fields, it's just a magnetization from the substrate. <clears throat> so we asked what would happen to the states on the edge of a ribbon. So we have the same, in this case is an edge, not an interface for simplicity, but, but it will be very similar as you can tell, as you can imagine. So, so you, um, I have a, I have a um, um, magnetic substrate in this, this uh, tellurium um, uh, or, or molytelluride in this case um, for, um, for commensurability reasons. And uh, just like we had the, the tight binding Hamiltonian, you can include magnetic exchange and you can include a Rashba field <clears throat> to make it more, more accordance with this. This is the technical and skip that. This is the result. So remember, uh, I have the, the, the different gaps. The, the bulk gaps are different on the two valleys, like I, I indicated in the, in the other slide. There are the edge states that are now split because it's like I'm applying again a magnetic field right on these edges. So the two different spins have now split. And I end up with levels that are that are open up like that. <clears throat> now there are two panels here because in addition to the exchange bias that is mostly on the Z, right? This by the way, here on the right, upper right, I have the, the cartoon of what was the ribbon the pristine ribbon without the exchange bias. And of course, the, here you have the four states, but they're all together here because the only split is the spin orbit. But here I, I have a combination of a spin orbit, uh, the, the magnetic biasing, the exchange, and also a Rashba because now I'm applying, uh, you know, I've broken the symmetry even further and then that creates a Rashba field. So I, the, the, the spin, gets shifted not only in the Z direction, if you will, but in another direction given by this Rashba field, which is here, it's called Y. So um, <clears throat> the fact that these symbols are dimmer than on the right is because the, there is most of the spin is still points in the Z direction, but, but, but it's simply tilted, right, with, the, with this Y. Now, of course, this is, this is molytelluride on, on europium sulfide, but you can imagine different materials. You can imagine, uh, again, you know, there are many different materials nowadays in, in what is the TMD, what, what are the magnetic exchange, you, you have chromium triiodide or man manganese oxide or whatever, and <clears throat> that will produce different exchange bias, different uh, gaps, and, and so you have a whole zoo of these. So, and, and to illustrate that, imagine that I take the same molytelluride, but I reuse the exchange bias. Right, because I put them in a different substrate, and so I, I have the same bulk structure, um, but the, the now the the uh, splitting of the edge states is less because the exchange bias is smaller, and and but it, it has the same peculiarities. Notice that here the the white component is dark is darker than above because the exchange bias is smaller. So that means that the Z component is is less strong, and the rash bias is still it's kind of uh, more on equal footing. So I've actually tilted the spins even more in this case, if you will. So by controlling the exchange bias, you can no longer, not only produce different splittings in energy, but also produce different orientations of the spins as you go. Now, <clears throat> why, why would that be interesting? So the, here, the, the experiment we have in mind is to look at current, right? To apply contact. Um, and, and again, imagine that, so this is the schematic of the, of the bands that I show you, uh, it's been split. Now the, the um, you can imagine gating the material in such a way that you put the Fermi level there. As I mentioned, the, the, the bulk will be insulating. You'll have only the states that are, you know, around the Fermi level conducting at low temperature. And so, oh, and, and what's here on the right, let me, what here on the right is, is the <clears throat> a calculation of the um, current that appears on the green side, which happens to be the Molly edge. Remember that there were two, the Molly and the, 
in the uh, calcogen etch. See, here the calcogen etch, which is this orange, is not populated yet, so of course the current is zero. So all the current is on the Molly etch. But as you can tell here, there are two, um, there are two projections, again, the Y and the Z, and, the, uh, and so there is some uh, current, and it has opposite signs. So the, the current in the Z direction is positive with some value, while the current in the Y direction, the other uh, orientation is negative, but it's still the net current is uh, the combination of the two with a tilt that depends on whichever of the two wins. So if I were to make a cartoon of this, this will be the ribbon. You can see that the, that the tellurium edge has no current because the, the, this guy is zero, but the uh, Molly edge has a current in some direction. Here is a top view, this is a side view that depends on, on the combination of these two currents, all right? Now, imagine that I change the Fermi level to this to increasing it. Now, I still have the two channels and the Molly edge. Now they're conducting roughly the same, but now I've started to conduct on the tellurium edge. And, and in fact, because it is just the beginning, it's only one branch and it conducts rather, rather well. So the cartoon of that shows again on the, on the uh, on the Mali is relatively the same, but the tellurium is now huge with a, with a strength that you can see is, is rather large and tilted. Again, it's canted because of all this um, com competition of the various spin orbits. Now, if I keep increasing the Fermi level, now I populate all of them. Now the two uh, channels in the tellurium also compete with each other and the cartoon is more like this, right? Where now I decrease the current, change the orientation of the spin, it, but I still have current on both edges. So if you, you the, the experiment to imagine is to deposit this on the magnetic substrate, put current contact, and depending on what is the gate voltage, I will have transmitting current along the edges that have a, that has a value in current in an orientation that is in principle controllable by this gate in uh, in composition. All right. So that that's the um, the, the specific signature of these such a state. So I, I um, yes, I, I'm under 10 minutes, I'm trying to convince you or uh, giving you that bit, but I, I, I hope I've, I've uh, sort of conveyed to you that there are these interesting interface states that we can describe them with um, uh, side binding uh, level, that, that they have interesting physics with um, to be explored, in particular this, RKKY interaction or, or magnetic biasing. And, and so, um, but there's many more things to consider in that we're, we're working. Anyways, with that, uh, again, remind you that Oscar and Natalia were the, the, main, the main doers of this work. Um, <clears throat> and um, this is a picture of Athens, Ohio in uh, maybe about a month ago, which is kind of, um, you know, hilly and foggy. Now it's just full of snow, by the way. Anyhow, thank you very much. Uh, um. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you. Uh, we are opening for questions. I have a question. Uh, Jarso? So, yeah. Okay, so first, thanks for the very nice talk, Sergio. It was uh, okay. quite motivating. Uh, on, on the second part, it's clear that the values are extremely relevant for the physics there. But uh, now I got confused. In the first part, do you need the value physics or the, the most important feature is the strong spin orbit coupling? No, I mean, it, 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 you, you need them both. You need the value physics in that, in that the, you need the values to be well separated. In, in, uh, and then, of, of course, the, the rest is, comes in with the spin orbit. But, but it, it is true. I mean, the, the obvious question is, what happens if you have defects on these interfaces or vacancies or whatever? Then, of course, values are no longer decoupled. And indeed, that's the case. And so uh, Natalia estimated what, a, what is that effect. Um, and if you, if you have, a, a, you know, in the calculations, right, putting defects on the, on the edges, say, for the current, of uh, I think it was 10 up to 10 15 percent then the the magnitude of these currents drops by maybe half all right so which is um, 
I mean, it's it's a strong suppression, but on the other hand, to have 10.3% is a lot. And so the the um, even though the effect is strictly not, as I was mentioning, not strictly topologically protected, it is very robust in, when you put in realistic numbers. And so, um, but you do need the value, both, you need both the value and the spin-off. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If, if not, I have, I have one. Um, I, I am not, not sure I, um, I understood completely the point you made that these, these states are not, uh, they are not topological. That's what you right. meant? Right. They are not they're topological. Not, they're not okay. topologically protected. Right. So, I mean, see, you can make a similar, if you look at the BHC, right, the, the Bernivig, uh, Hughes, uh, Zhang, Hamiltonian for okay. topological insulators, mm -hmm. it looks very similar. The, but, it, but in that case, the spin is involved. And so you can make the whole argument with a, with a single, valley, sing, single valley and spin, and there the, the protection comes precisely because of the spin. So if you have a scalar impurity, then the, 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 if you have a state that goes in one direction, the state that is backscattered needs to also flip spin. And then okay. the matrix element, because you have only a scalar impurity, then the matrix element is zero. So, so that is an honest to God protection. Now, of course, if you have a magnetic impurity, you can also break it, but then that then is not protected. Okay. But, but that's, so, I mean, it's, you know, as I, as I like uh, to say, the topological protection was taken when the spin was considered, and now this one is not topological, but it's still a structural protection. Okay. Right? But but it's not a big but because it's, it's easier to disrupt the structure than to disrupt the structure and the spin is not as well protected. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you. But my my question is motivated by. Uh, I don't know if you know this this paper. I'm gonna put the DOI on the chat mm. so you can uh, can take a look at uh -huh. it. Just I don't know if you know this if you know this paper. When you see you gonna uh, be able to tell me. Yeah, it's a PRL by Vu, Bernadette and Zhang, where uh. they. Uh, they say that they they prove a theorem mm -hmm. that the uh, the topological edge states cannot be modeled by a one D if it's a if it's an in a match it cannot be modeled by a one D uh, model. Oh uh, yes 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 I, I know so you yes you yes. know this would yes, this yes yes yes. yes. Would this state in your system have the same? Would you be able to tell? Would I be able to tell? Uh, if this is if these states in the edge of your system, if they have this property too, because this seems to be a very strong, very strong property that makes it difficult to work with this, because you really have to solve the whole thing. You cannot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I know of I've, people I've, from yeah. uh, from from uh, quantum field theory that try to do this. Uh, they say that they succeed and everything, but apparently I cannot. I didn't quite understand the proof of this uh, theorem. Mm. But if it's a theorem, uh, it's uh, you cannot uh, you. you just because you are using quantum field theory, you are not you are not allowed to violate the theorem, right? <laughs> no, but I am using quantum field theory. Well, still. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know what they want to do, but yes. No, no, I think it's I I mean I think the point of that PRL is basically to say that that uh, you need you you, you need, need to have the right topological uh, structure to have a helical state. You, you you need all the, the ingredients, so you need the bulk. There's yeah. no way. Oh, oh I mean, uh, the, 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 you know, it's, there's always this question that that the 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 well, it's it's kind. Of, I mean, I make it here too that 
the, the existence of these funny edges is, is only because you're changing the symmetry of the system at the interface. But, mm -hmm. but in order for the state to appear, you need to have the structure inside. So if you don't have it, if the structure inside is trivial, well, you can break it whichever way you want, you will, it will not appear. The structure right? on you, both sides. You need that. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. You, need to yeah. have, you need to have a switch. Yes. A switch, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Um, more questions? Yeah, I, I got one. Um, last part of the yeah. talk. When you, yeah. I think you have a, a magnetic field along the, the y direction and in and the z the, direction, but uh, uh -huh. okay. I, I think what is the effect, the direction of the effect, uh, Hajba field? Uh, I, I'm asking it, because. Uh, uh -huh. Go, go, go. go. It's the y. Because, it's in the y direction. But why are you? All right. So, yeah. So, so then, if you apply, if you apply your magnetic field along the y direction, the system would be quite insensitive to the to the to the magnetic external magnetic field because the the spin points are already along those to the y direction. Is that right? Did you try? Did you check that? Sure. I mean, you can you can pull around with with the direction. I mean, the the idea is that the exchange is mostly in the direction of the of the plane. But just I mean, a simple argument that it's just because it's it's um it's um it's exchange driven, right? So it is given mostly by orbitals, and at the time would be mostly the z direction. It's it's uh, you know what I mean? But but it but it, it's uh. Uh, so I, 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 I'm learning, and whenever I look at these so these orbital uh, rich environments, that sometimes somebody's Z is somebody else's uh, tilted axis. So you have to be careful. But but so I, I I think I think the 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 direction is kind of set by the material and the geometry. It's hard to change it. Although right, but happens. but external field you can change. Oh, oh right. sure, sure, sure. Right, sure. so. I'm, yeah. So it's yeah. highly okay. anisotropic. You can do whatever. Yeah. So it's highly anisotropic because if you if you if you change your magnetic field to other direction, the system could not respond the same way. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In so fact, these materials are very, very icing like. So the 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 spin orbit that dominates is in the z direction and mm -hmm. really strong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have I have a question. Uh, yeah. I, honestly, I got a little lost at the second part of your talk. So uh, okay. I guess my question is, uh, if you're still uh, at the second part, you're still considering uh, the interface between this uh, two monolayer CMDs. I I wasn't, but but that 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 was mostly uh, for simplicity of the model and the calculations. I mean, if you think about it. Uh, let me, the, okay, so imagine, so we did it for an, for an honest to God edge, but, but, but I could make the same argument that if I went to the, um, oh, sorry, more, to, I want to get to the dispersion of the, of the interface, of the, ribbon, of the interface here, oh, too much, so I, I can argue that, so this is the interface. And if I did, you know, the magnetic biasing, that means that the two curves that you see here in blue and in gray will be split because of the exchange bias. Now the dispersion will not be uh, like I had in the other case, which was just splitting this green one, but it will be splitting this blue one. And when I do that, then of course I will have the same, uh, qualitatively the same kind of physics. You split it, depending on where the Fermi level is, you will have currents of different direction and so on. The big difference is that of course, as you keep uh, biasing, uh, gating, then there will be a point where you're in the gap and, and the whole thing is insulating, except for the outer edges. So, so you, will, you will be able to turn, in that case, you will have three different possible conduits of current, one of the outer edges, one in the middle, and you can, uh, by the gate, turn the middle and or the edges or whatever. But you see, it's, it's very, 
um, the calculation wasn't done there just for simplicity of, of, of coding, right? I mean, it's, it's, this needs more atoms, more time to run everything. And so, but, but we think the physics is the same. I see, does, thank you does, very much. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Uh, I have then a, a quick follow-up on my yeah. on my question. Uh, the what what these people were trying to do was the following: they uh, they uh, they said, well, uh, imagine that the system has interactions, and I am looking at this edge channel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna behave as a Luttinger uh, liquid because it's one D mm -hmm. and has interactions. Yeah. And then we're going to model it as a 1D model because the most important thing is are the interactions and we're going to add the topologies somehow. But I, I don't, don't buy this, this argument that because the most important interaction is the, are the correlations, that this somehow uh, validates the 1D model. Uh, I, I did the calculations with uh, some calculations with Adrian. I don't think uh -huh. he's there anymore. Uh, where uh, we we modeled a a nano ribbon that had edge states, and we put impurities at the edge, and we were able using the MRG to to see that the edge channel uh, goes around the impurity. You can calculate the spin correlations for the condo mm -hmm. uh, effect. And mm -hmm. you can see clearly that the edge channel goes around the, the impurity. If, if you embed the magnetic impurity in the, in the, edge. the, in the edge, as, as, a, as an, uh, not as an add-on, but uh, in the place of one of the atoms in the, in the edge. And the channel goes goes around it, and you cannot you cannot model that with a purely one D, one D. No, no, exactly. No, no, no. I mean, right, right. I, I, the the thing is that when once you go to an effective one D model, then I think that you're it's like a hierarchy of interactions. You're you're making a statement as to what yeah. interactions are more more uh, relevant. In in. Um, Sure, and then so we, I mean, we all play that game, to be honest, but, uh -huh. but uh, sometimes the, the game, you know, you... you if, uh, if the thing that you are trying to study is the RKKY, and the RKKY is mediated by this channel, and this channel cannot be modeled by a 1D uh, model, then, then you, are, you, are, you are losing something. I, 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 I would. No, no, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, ultimately, I mean, there is this question, there is this philosophical question that, okay, you have a topological insulator has surface states that are conducting even if you have an insulator in the boat. But, but if you start making defects in the material, right, then yeah. at what point does the topological protection go away? And people have actually tried to study this. And, and the question, the answer I don't think is terribly trivial. Depends on how you model it, right? Because eventually the, the coherence of the state that is protecting that surface will go away if you put enough defects in the bulk. Never mind surface. If you put uh -huh. enough defects in the bulk. And, okay. and how that transition occurs is, is anybody's guess on, really, as far okay. as I can tell. I think. Uh, uh, can I make a comment? Yeah, yes, sure. please. So I didn't know this paper, and I was trying to read it quite uh, quickly here. So not sure if I, of, of uh, if what I'm going to say is exactly correct. But my first impression is that what he's saying is that if you have a 1D model on a lattice, you're gonna have uh, 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 the bands crossing at k equals zero, and then due to time reversal at k equals plus or minus pi the bands have to close again. Uh, so this is somehow related to the fermion doubling problem. It's the same thing. You cannot have an odd number of states in this 1D model. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I have to read the paper carefully because my impression is that if you add a Wilson mass, as I did with Vernack some time ago in another paper, a recent paper, if you add a Wilson mass with a quadratic term, you can actually break uh, the crossing at uh, k equal pi while keeping the physics at k equals zero approximately the same as it was before. But the trick that I put in my paper is that you have to choose the Wilson mass appropriately such that it doesn't break the symmetries of your system. Uh, and the idea is that this is always possible. In, in this PRV that I published a few years ago, I showed that this is always possible, but there I wasn't focusing on 1D models. Uh, there I was actually discussing 2D models in general, mm -hmm. but uh, from the top of my mind, I don't think it's different if I go to, to 1D. So uh, now I wonder if it's possible to do it with the proper Wilson mass. I'll, I'll check. If I find something, I'll let you know. But you have to, to somehow change the model, right? By adding this Wilson mass. Well, the point is, is if, I, is if I, if, yeah, yeah. But the model, uh, the model is, you can think about it as a perturbation, uh, per perturbation expansion. So you have the, 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 the K equals zero, the K quadratic, the K cubic terms and so on. It's a perturbation expansion. So the model is, is the same in the sense that if I add a Wilson mass that doesn't break any symmetries, I'm basically adding a, a higher order perturbation to the same model. I mean, in the sense that it's a model built from the same symmetries. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the key is whether you can keep the symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Any, anyone has more questions? Uh, I think we are a little bit late already. So um, this is even later for Sergio. So um, very nice talk, Sergio. Thank you very much. Thank you. For, for, it was uh, great seeing you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. Nice to see you. Um, nice talk. And once you stop recording, then it, uh, you can oh, end the link. Yeah. Okay.